Good evening, it's uh, March 25th, 2020. And this evening we are going through our evening Bible study for First Baptist Church of Walteria. I'm glad to have you join us. And we are doing this from home. And uh, we hopefully you can take opportunity to, to look at this and to walk with God. And we're doing it from home because of uh, a stay-at-home order here in California. <clears throat> Tonight's study is on uh, being a soldier for Jesus Christ. The study is called Turn on the Power. And this is uh, Pathways to Victory in the Christian Life. And we are focusing on the path to victory, which is personal commitment. <clears throat> and we will talk about one area of personal commitment tonight, which is being a good soldier for Jesus Christ. Um, all right, God has given us several pathways of victory. We looked at six already. Let me just review those So we've already talked about. We've talked about the Bible as a pathway of victory. The gospel gives us victory. Prayer gives us victory in life. Holy Spirit, our church family, and personal commitment. So this is the sixth one. And this is uh, uh, one that we're focusing on tonight. Additionally, uh, there are several pictures of the Christian life, the Christian walk with God that the Bible gives us. And one of those is a soldier. We're considered to be soldiers of Christ. Another one is an athlete. Another picture is that of a farmer. And a fourth one is that of a martyr. Uh, we're focusing in this lesson on the picture of a Christian being a soldier and the commitment a soldier has for Christ. We're to be like a soldier. There are various passages in Scripture that are required for us to be soldiers. Uh, let me pray, and then we will get into our lesson tonight. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would guide us as we study tonight. We thank you we can come to you. Um, thank you with the advent of technology and some wonderful opportunities. You uh, allow us to have a Bible study, even though we can't be with each other personally. But we can uh, <coughs> connect together privately through our homes, and we ask God you would take this message tonight to connect with our hearts, that we need to be a soldier for you, uh, fighting the good fight of faith. Uh, <clears throat> lead us in our time together, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Back in 1724, there was a man named Isaac Watts, and he was a pastor and a hymn writer. We've uh, Many of us have sung various songs that he wrote. One of those songs he wrote was called Holy Fortitude. Now, if you look up Holy Fortitude in, in a hymnal, you're not going to find his song. Many of us know that song by a different title, and the title of that song is Am I a Soldier of the Cross? Back in 1724, and he wrote that to coincide with one of the sermons he was preaching. That song has six verses, although many of us are not familiar with verses five and six. The verses are very short. Let me read those to you. Uh, many of you will be able to connect with uh, some of those verses. You've heard of them and sung them before. Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And shall I fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? Are there no foes for me to face? Must I not stem the flood? Is this vile world a friend to grace to help me on to God? Since I must fight if I would reign, increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain supported by thy word. Verses 5 and 6, which are new verses to me. I've never heard them before. Thy saints in all this glorious war shall conquer, though they die. They view the triumph from afar and seize it with their eye. Verse 6, when that illustrious day shall rise and all thine armies shine in robes of victory through the skies, thy glory shall, the glory shall be thine. Am I a soldier of the cross by Isaac Watts? Well, when you think of the idea of being a soldier for Christ, what comes into your mind when you think about that? If you probably ask that in a group of people, you might have several different answers. Some of those answers would probably be answers like this. 
Uh, we're a soldier because we have to deal with worldly ideas that the world throws at us. We're soldiers because we have to deal with personal sin. We're soldiers because we have to deal with the strategies of the devil. Uh, we're soldiers because we have to work or to choose to think right, right perspective. We have to choose to believe right, right doctrine. And we have to choose to live right with right applications and actions. Various ways that we're soldiers because we're in a battle for our lives and our hearts and our minds in eternity. So we're soldiers. Now tonight we're going to look at several passages out of Scripture and look at three main ideas about being a soldier. One, God's soldiers have divine, not human armor and weapons. Secondly, they use divine strategies for victory in spiritual warfare, and God's soldiers know their enemy. So let's start with the first one here, which is God's soldiers have divine, not human armor and weapons. If you have a Bible, I'll take you, your Bible with me tonight, and we were looking at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14 through 17. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14 through 17. Galatians 6, verse 14, it says this, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. In this passage, we are given ideas about the spiritual armor of the Christian. I'm just going to share those briefly with you. Uh, <clears throat> each of those are vitally important to our life as Christians. So the first one is in verse 14. It is the belt of truth. Uh, these are not physical uh, items. They are spiritual items. And so essentially it's just a picture of what these things do. And so we have truth and it's vitally important in our lives as Christians. I think it's important to realize this is the first that's named issue of truth. Uh, so God says if you're going to win battles for him, uh, win battles in our spiritual life, you got to deal, start with truth. So we have the belt of truth. That's number one. Then in verse 14, it talks about the breastplate of righteousness. And so God indicates that we need to live a righteous life. And as we put on righteousness as part of our life, of living rightly, dealing with the challenges of a life, we are able to win battles. Realize as a breastplate, it covers our heart. So there's a sort of a picture there of if I live right, it covers my spiritual heart. <clears throat> if I don't live right, I get beaten and I get uh, wounded. I need to live right before God. Number three, in verse 15, it says, Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Number three is the shoes of the gospel of peace. Uh, with that we just simply have two parts of that is the gospel, God's good news, which is the good news of peace. I have peace with God. And uh, we want to put that on our part of our life. Into part of our life is the gospel of peace. Um, <clears throat> we need the good news, and the good news is peace with God. Uh, that does not mean the absence of physical war. That means peace with God, which is a totally different issue. Then number uh, four is the shield of faith. In verse 16, it says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Satan wants to work on your faith to destroy it. Um, God says he wants to work on our faith to help it be used as a shield to protect our lives. And uh, we need to 
exercise our faith of trusting in God. So when you ask when you ask in prayer about things, you need to ask yourself, am I really believing that God could answer this prayer? If you say, I'm praying, but I really don't believe God can answer this prayer, then you need to ask God to give you faith. Right? Well, we have a shield of faith. Fifthly is the helmet of salvation. And so salvation, we have salvation with God if we are a believer in Jesus Christ. And that's a vital part for us to stand in battle as uh, Satan would like to make us think that we maybe lose our salvation for one reason or another, or our salvation is insufficient, uh, even though we accepted Christ as Savior. Just on a, a note, side note here is, how can I know Christ as Savior? Well, that's a good question. Um, often, if you ask people, how can I know Christ is my Savior? Uh, some people will just say, well, well, just believe. Well, what are you supposed to believe? Well, simple uh, put this down as ABC. I need to uh, believe and understand I'm a sinner. A, I admit I'm a sinner. Uh, and I need a Savior. B, I believe on Jesus Christ. And this word Jesus Christ, our belief in Jesus Christ comes in. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, it indicates Jesus Christ is the one who died for my sins. To forgive my sins, wipe them out, all of them. And he was, then he was buried, and then he rose again from the grave, living, absolutely physically living, not just a, not a spirit, but in physical form, he was living. And so uh, I put my trust in him as the living God who died to wipe out my sins, was buried, rose again, death, burial, resurrection. And then I confess. I need him to be my savior. I'll just look quickly at two passages that put that together. Uh, read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4. In that passage where it tells us what the gospel is. It says 15, 1, 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, and in which you stand. By which you are also saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that <coughs> he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, Peter, and then by twelve, and goes on, seen by various people. This is the gospel. And one of the main passages, just to explain that, is out of Romans. Uh, again, how to respond to the gospel. <clears throat> Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 11 and 13. It says, Romans 10, 9, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. All right, that's salvation. So we have what? the armor of the Christian, the belt of truth. Uh, the shoes of the gospel, uh, the breastplate of righteousness, shield of faith, and helmet of salvation. So those are part of our spiritual armor. Then we come to deal with um, weapons. What are the weapons that the Christian uses in his or her walk with God? And there are three primary weapons put forth. One is the, the Bible, which is the sword of the Spirit. Secondly, prayer. And uh, thirdly, I believe, is witnessing as a possible a third option for a spiritual weapon <clears throat> for how to fight our enemies, spiritual battle. So, uh, back in Ephesians chapter 6, I'm looking at verses 17 through 19. 
Ephesians 6, 17 through 19. It says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Three weapons in verse 17. The sword of the Spirit is the Bible. <clears throat> and as a Christian, I need to fully engage my use of God's word in my life to what I do. Uh, some Christians, um, they think they can hear the Bible once taught once a week. That's sufficient for their life. Um, consider this not only like a weapon, but like your spiritual food. I am not aware of anybody who would go through one week and only eat one meal. If they do that, they are considered sick. Okay? And a person who only goes through the one week and only has takes in God's word as food once a week, they become spiritually sick. Okay? So we need to take in God's word on a regular basis, daily basis. In fact, God's word encourages us to do it on a daily basis, according to Psalm 1. Get it into our life. Study it. Learn it. Memorize it. Think about it. Consider how it works. Consider how, we're, how to apply it. How to deal with our problems. Uh, how to deal with society and understand society and the issues and the challenges that are faced. Always back to the God's Word. We have a challenge right now in our culture. Uh, and that challenge what we are facing as a culture right now in the United States, and I mean globally, is this coronavirus. So how am I supposed to think about coronaviruses? Uh, or any kind of flu virus for that matter, any kind of virus for that matter. But one of the ways I realize God tells me I live in a fallen world and because of sin in the world, there will be problems in the world. That's because of sin. And so, uh, because Adam and Eve sinned, therefore, sin came into the world, and we have a fallen world with problems in the world, such as viruses. <clears throat> uh, that's a biblical understanding of how to understand and deal with that. So I understand this is what it is. But on the other hand, I realize that it's good. Uh, humans create in God's image that God gives us the ability to think and work for uh, finding solutions and figuring out how to deal with the challenges of life. That's a God-given ability we're made in His image. We have the ability to think, to reason, to figure out things and understand them. All right, so we use God's Word on a regular basis in our life, day by day. We need to memorize it. We need to study it. We need to read it. You need to think about it. You need to learn it. All right. A second weapon is prayer. Here in Ephesians six eighteen, we pray always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. So I believe a second weapon that God gives us to fight the battles of life is prayer. First is the Bible. Second is prayer. Don't take the Bible out. Don't take prayer out. We need both of them. Uh, you need to be praying on a regular basis. And then a third one in verse 19, I think we could consider this as part of the, the weapon of a Christian life. It talks about utterance be given me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Verse 20, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I, in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So here we have God's truth being proclaimed, the gospel being proclaimed proclaimed in witnessing and we need to be witnesses for jesus christ and we use that uh, as a weapon in in this challenge of life as we deal with the challenges of life now just make a note here is that this is involves both a lifestyle example and a verbal a speaking in terms of my witness some people uh, talk about the one and not the other. They get mixed up. This is one of those things we need both, not either or. We need to be living an example of godly life as a witness. <clears throat> Secondly, we also need to be living a life 
where we're speaking of God's work in our lives of salvation and the need of the gospel and how Christ changes lives and families and societies when people come to know Christ as their Savior. So we need to have a lifestyle example and a verbal example. Uh, one without the other is like a hand without a glove. Okay? A hand and a glove or two hands together, fits together, take one out, things flop. Doesn't work. Okay? You need to have both together. If you, need to, if you live a godly lifestyle but don't ever speak for Jesus, how can they know? If you speak for Jesus but don't live a godly lifestyle, they'll look at you and, and laugh about your hypocrisy. Okay? You need the lifestyle and the verbal witness. All right, so that's God's soldiers have divine armor and weapons to work with. Secondly, point two. God's soldiers use divine strategies for victory in spiritual warfare. In this point, there are six different mental strategies I believe Christians need to uh, work with in their life to have victory in their walk with God. Six different mental strategies. So, uh, this will turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians 10, I mean. In Romans 10, and in this passage, we're going to talk about the spiritual warfare that Christians is engaged in. And so, Paul is a, wrote, wrote this book through the hand of God, through God's inspiration, and helps us understand about living for God. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 3 to 6. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity, into the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So here's six mental strategies for spiritual victory in your life to walk with God in the right way. First one, we pull down spiritual strongholds. A stronghold is, is a mountain fortress. And then on top of a mountain, you have a fortress. It was high. It was uh, hard to go against because they could always come down against you. And they could see things that were going on. Uh, so it's always hard to combat high mountain fortresses. This is what a stronghold was. In the context of this passage, strongholds refer to falsehoods that the world, the flesh, and the devil have put into our lives that have to be conquered. The Bible doesn't ever tell us to conquer Satan, but we're rather to... Uh, conquer falsehood by bringing God's truth into the situation in our lives. Now, what are some things that could be strongholds? Uh, these are things that are entrenched in our lives that are sinful. Maybe it's a family sin that has become a, a habit from one generation to the next to the next. Maybe it's addiction that people have accepted as unbreakable. Maybe it's a sin that people just say, it's just a normal part of my life. I don't need to really deal with it. Uh, but God says we need to deal with all sin. God wants us to break down the strongholds of sin in our life. Whatever they are, God can give victory if we follow him and trust in him and obey him. Uh, it may not be easy, but God can give victory. We are to pull down spiritual strongholds by God's truth. In John 17, Jesus had a, a prayer to the Father, and he says in John 17, 14 to 17, I've given them your word, speaking to the Father, the world has hated them because they're not of the world. Just as I am not of the world, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. 
sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So we pull down strongholds, spiritual strongholds, sin strongholds by God's truth, put it into our lives and apply it. Okay. Second idea, we cast down imaginations. This is in verse 5, uh, or cast down arguments. Well, what does that refer to? This refers to thoughts, ideas, speculations, reasonings, philosophies, false religions, and uh, those things which are against God's pattern of what's true about what to believe. And we are to take those false ideas and put God's truth in its place. And we are to cast that down, throw those things down, put God's truth in its place. Not live by false ideas, false philosophies, false religions, uh, various other things. We need to let God's truth be the, the power to put this in its place. Then verse number three, we cast down everything that goes against God. There in verse five, uh, we cast down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Cast out everything. Uh, anything that goes against God's way, we are to cast it down. Okay? Anything in our life goes against God. Push it out. Don't that, that be part of your life. Okay? Uh, the idea is everything. That means everything. Anything that would come against us. All right. A couple more ideas. Four, five, and six here. Um, we are to capture every thought to be in line with obedience to Christ. We talk about in verse 5. It says, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So, every thought is to be in obedience to God's pattern, not ours. Not my culture. I'm not to follow my culture above God. God's pattern needs to be above my culture, above my upbringing, above my ethnicity, above my community, above my personality, my education, uh, above my experiences in life. I need to have God's word be the pattern. Everything must go to the filter of God's word. Uh, and none of those things have any higher allegiance than God and God's ways, God's truth, God's word. Okay. Full allegiance must go to God in my thought life. Unfortunately, there are some Christians out there that say, well, that's just my culture. I'm not going to follow God because my culture, because my culture is more important. Well, you've got an idol of your culture if you do that. Some say, well, that's, uh, that's just my personality. I have to keep sinning because that's my personality. No, you don't. Okay, God wants to say, are you committed to God first? Okay, not your personality and uh, various other things. You will say, well, that's uh, that's just my that's just my view on things. Well, is it in line with God's word? If it isn't in line with God's word, you have to let God's word be where you give your full allegiance, and it's full allegiance, not partial. Okay. God wants us to follow his pattern in all the areas of our life. Okay? <clears throat> this reminds me of Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And those passages really help us to understand how to deal with these issues. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay? My first allegiance is not to my culture, my ethnicity, not to my education, my upbringing, my experiences, uh, none of those things. My first allegiance is to God. I want everything in my life to be according to God's pattern, not all the other possible patterns in life. Okay, But I capture every thought to be in line with obedience to Christ. 
Number five, we're to keep a good conscience even in the storms of life. So this is found in 1 Timothy. I'm looking at 1 Timothy 1.19. 1 Timothy 1.19. <clears throat> Starting in verse 18, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage a good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected, concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck, spiritual ruin in their lives because they did not keep a good conscience. So in the challenges of life, I need to live in such a way that I will have a good conscience. I will say I've made the right choices even in the difficulties of life. <clears throat> if I don't do that, when I get out of the difficulties, I will have to deal with the problems that I've created. And so we need to just walk away from those and say, I'm going to live right, whether it's good or bad. I need to have a good conscience by the way I live in the storms of life. Number six here is from 1 Timothy 6, 12. 1 Timothy 6, 12. That verse says, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, to which you are also called, and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Number six, we fight a good fight of faith. <clears throat> and uh, that's what we do. It's a fight of faith. We have to fight it. Sometimes we have to just say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. Everything looks against this possibility. I'm going to just trust you in this challenging situation. But we fight a good fight of faith. The Greek word for fight uh, is the gives us the word uh, English word agonize is used both in military and athletics to describe the concentration discipline and extreme effort needed to win those uh, competitions and our good fight of faith is with spirit is Satan was against is against Satan's spiritual kingdom of darkness and all people of God are involved in this fight of faith. God says we need to fight the good fight of faith. Every Christian needs to be engaged with fighting a fight of faith in trusting God. <clears throat> so that's our source of trust. He's our ultimate source of help. Our ultimate source of hope is God. Okay. We need to fight the good fight of faith. All right, let me give you eight active strategies. Eight active strategies. So I give you some six mental ones, eight active strategies. So here uh, we have those, uh, several of those. So let's just start out. First one, we revenge, punish, or discipline all acts of disobedience. This is found in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 6. 2 Corinthians 10, 6. There it says, And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. We need to respond to dis disobedience in our own lives by disciplining ourselves or providing discipline for others. <clears throat> we live in a world that says, Oh, don't discipline people. Uh, that's terrible, you know, just let it go on, just, uh, uh, and I came out of psychology, and psychology often says, well, you, you got a problem there, you, I know we, you sin, but you need to just keep doing it until you don't feel bad about it. That's not God's way, that's the devil's way, okay? We want to follow God's way of dealing with, of dealing with our own sins and say, okay, I got a sin in my life, let's get it out. Stop. We don't walk that way again. We don't follow that pattern. We don't look in that direction again. We need to follow God's pattern and discipline ourselves so that the sin will stop. Number two, from 1 Timothy 1 9. It's so similar to what we mentioned before. 1 Timothy 1 9. The verse says, 
19, I'm sorry. Having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. We are to hold to the faith of biblical truths even in the storms of life. It's easy to hold to faith in the good times. All of us know that. Uh, but what about the hard times? In the hard times, do you still hold to your faith? How about if you lose your job, will you hold your faith? How about if you lose your health, will you hold your faith? How about if you lose a large amount of money in the stock market, will you hold to your faith? True faith is not what we're like in good times, but it's like what we're like in hard times. Now that's the issue, okay? True faith comes out in the hard times. And a lot of people in the hard times, you realize they never had true faith to begin with, they gave it up because they wouldn't stand in the hard times. Their faith was too weak or maybe wasn't faith, faith at all. Maybe it was just a social thing. <clears throat> we hold to faith of biblical truths even in the storms of life. Number three, we endure hardness as a spiritual soldier for Jesus Christ. Second Timothy chapter two, verse three. Let me read that passage. Second Timothy two three. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Verse 4, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Number 3, we endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Uh, this phrase of enduring hardship is only mentioned twice in the New Testament. And... Uh, the other place where it's mentioned is 2 Timothy 1.8, and it means to share afflictions with each other. But we endure afflictions, we endure hardships because of Jesus Christ. And this is what Paul was doing with Timothy. He said, you're going to, you've got to endure the hardship. It doesn't mean that you'll be overcome by the hardship, but that you need to endure it. Endure sufferings and endure difficult treatment. And you expect ultimate victory with God. All right, number four. We don't entangle ourselves with worldly issues. Okay, so uh, a good soldier of Christ refuses to allow the things of the world to distract us from following him. Okay, if we have a thing that's distracting us, we need to step back and say, okay, I'm not going to do that. Okay. For some people, certain things are distracting. Other people, it isn't, okay? Uh, so I have a friend, and for her, one of the distractions she has was chocolate. And uh, she said every time she would eat chocolate, it would actually change her personality. And she just almost wasn't even the same person, so she couldn't respond things normally. Now, most of us, when we eat chocolate, never doesn't do that to us. We might like chocolate, enjoy it. But that lady, she would actually have her personality would change, okay, when she ate chocolate, like, like a drug. So she had to walk back and say, okay, I won't use that. I don't want to eat it, okay? Other people, maybe uh, some kind of sports. Well, somebody I know, and they say they can't play golf because that's distracting from their walk with God. For me, it's not distracting from my walk with God if I play golf. If I did play golf, it would just... Make me feel like I can't do it. I need to do something else since I can't do well with that. But you need to figure out what I can't work with. Okay, and if it entangles you to walk away from God, then you need to stop doing it. Then 2 Timothy 2.4 says a fifth idea here, which is we please God who has chosen us to be a soldier. We please God who has chosen us to be a soldier. That's part of our active Involvement. I need to ask myself, does this please God? Does this please God? Many things that we do, they please us, but we need to ask ourselves, does this please God? Ask ourselves that question. <clears throat> and a lot of times the answer would be real clear and real plain. No, it doesn't please God, but I'm going to do it anyway. Then you need to just not do it. Okay. Well, another pathway to victory, number seven here. Number six is from 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 5, 
It says, be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. This is the number six, you are to be watchful about or for the spiritual battle around us. Okay, and so things are going all around us. We need to be try to be aware of things, of spiritual things that are uh, causing problems uh, for us to walk with God. Maybe it's some thought life. Maybe it's in our actions. Maybe it's in our perspective on the world around us. Many, maybe it's uh, relationships that are causing problems. Maybe it's actions in those relationships. And we need to say, okay, Lord, how am I to live in a way that honors you? Okay. So God's word needs to be so central to our lives that in every part of our lives we ask, does this honor God? And I need to watch those things, my attitudes, my actions, my perspectives, what I believe, what I do, okay? my responses. All those things need to come under the guidance of God's word. Yeah. Uh, so I need to be watchful. All parts of my life need to be under God's guidance. Then also in verse 5 here in 2 Timothy 4, 5, Timothy 4, 5, is we are to witness for Christ. Part of our action to have victory in life is to witness for Christ. <clears throat> uh, Satan doesn't want you to witness for Christ, but God wants you to then. And I'll have victory as you witness for him. Uh, eighth idea here is we are to be fully committed to our ministry. Whatever ministry God has given you, uh, whatever uh, church, local church fellowship you're a part of, you need to be fully committed to the ministry you're a part of. Okay? Don't put one foot half in and the other foot half out. Be fully committed to your ministry. And this is what Paul was writing to Timothy. Fulfill your ministry. Be committed to what you're doing. Okay, you want to have victory in your life? Be committed to it. Don't walk half this way, half another way. Okay. All right. So eight ideas there about victory in our life as Christians, as a soldier. All right. Three positional strategies. And we're nearing the end here. Three positional strategies, and these are all three very similar ones from the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. Ephesians 6, looking at verses 10 through 14. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Positional st strategies, I need to stand. Number one, stand strong in God's power, not my own. I'm dealing with a challenge in life. I need to say, God, I want to stand in your power, not my power. I want to stand in your way. Okay. A number of years ago, I was dealing with a challenge of uh, <clears throat> one of the churches I served at. And a, a man was coming against me pretty viciously. And that morning, I just prayed, God, uh, give me wisdom as I deal with this person. And... Uh, that person just, just unloaded on me, just one thing after another, how terrible, terrible, terrible things were. And uh, I just uh, didn't have any, uh, I wasn't terrified of his accusations. It, they weren't bothering to me. Uh, I'd heard some of those already. Uh, and I knew he was just uh, bitter uh, about a certain issue. And so God's power helped me to go through that conversation without becoming volatile while he was volatile. But we need to stand strong in God's power, not in our power. It needs a lot of prayer sometimes. Number two, we stand against the deceptive strategies of the devil. This idea of standing, standing, standing when we're in spiritual challenges. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We stand against the deceptive strategies of Satan. Okay? 
We don't give in. We don't compromise. We don't play with it. We don't say, okay, we'll go halfway on that. We just refuse to go with Satan's strategies. We stand against the strategies of the devil, the deceptive strategies. Three, we stand in spiritual battle against our spiritual enemies. <clears throat> Verse 13 and 14, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, they may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. We are to stand in spiritual battle against all our enemies, whether that's the world, the flesh, or the devil. We stand in God's power, in God's way, God's word. Okay. All right, positional strategies. The last point is this today. God's soldiers understand their true enemies. There are three main enemies of God's people. One, the devil. Secondly, the flesh. And thirdly, the world. Here in Ephesians 6, 11 and 12, it says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We know our enemies, God's soldiers, God's people need to know their enemies, which is the devil and the various spiritual forces we're dealing with. That's number one. Secondly is our flesh. And in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 to 6, we have Again, our flesh. We read this before. Let me read it again. It says, 2 Corinthians 10, 3, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. And it goes on to those verses. We have a battle with our human flesh, our spiritual weaknesses, and we have to stand against it and say, I need to follow God's ways, not my own human personality, my human inclinations, my human thoughts. I need to go God's ways, not my own flesh. And then the affairs of life, which is worldliness. And 2 Timothy speaks to this when Paul addresses him to be a good soldier for Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 2, 3 to 4. It says, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare and get tangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may place him who enlisted him as a soldier. So the affairs of life, which is worldliness, which are in opposition to God's ways. We need to know our enemies, the devil, our flesh, and the worldliness around us. Well, there's a couple verses to remind ourselves here, really key verses here out of a 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 3. It says, Therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that you've heard from me among witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So we need to get, endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ. Let me just close with an illustration here tonight. Um, uh, pastor Green, a, a pastor friend of mine that I worked for a number of years ago, uh, he worked number of years past age 70, I don't know how long, but a number of years. And when I would meet with him, he'd occasionally tell me the story of a, of a pastor friend that he had known through the years. I, I don't know the man's name, but he was a retired man. And uh, he would talk about retiring and things like that, but he would say, I don't plan to retire. I just plan to refire for God. And that's the life of a Christian. No person, no matter how old they are, who is constantly striving to live for God, ever retires from the life of being a soldier for God. We are always in the process, hopefully, prayerfully, of refiring for God to be a soldier for Him. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we've thought through some aspects of being a soldier for Jesus Christ, help us to take those to heart. Help us to put those into our lives. Help us to realize we are in a culture where it is uh, a challenge to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Help us to realize 
We deal with our own flesh and the world around us, which are constantly pressing us to be walking in ways that are not godly. Help us to walk in your ways. May your word sink into our lives, make it part of our lives, a daily part of our lives. Help us to put these patterns of uh, the weapons you give us for spiritual warfare, the armor for Christian for spiritual warfare, the actions for spiritual warfare and attitudes. Help us to put those into our lives that we can be victorious in the challenges that we face. Lord, as we uh, end tonight, Lord, as help us remember our country, the challenges that are faced over the coronavirus, and the challenges that we need to face, and say, Lord, how can we live for you, even with the challenges of the day? Thank you. We can come to you with these prayer requests and any other ones that we have and bring those to you. Thank you to God who, who says in your word, nothing's impossible for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.